Hi, everyone. Welcome to uh, first one of the first sessions at ACPE. I'm James Kelly with OETC, and welcome to Centralized Logging, a single pane of glass for all your events, presented by Nathan McNulty, previously the Systems Administrator for Beaverton School District. After the talk, I'll host a brief Q&A, so feel free to type any questions you have during the session into the feed that's just to the right of the screen and the chats. And if you have, <clears throat> and not in fact, in, in the Q&A tab, just the regular feed. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Nathan. Good morning, everybody. Nice and early. Um, so today we're gonna be talking about Graylog um, primarily. Uh, getting that stood up it can be any uh, centralized logging, whether you like Elk or um, Humio is another free one online. You can use Splunk if your uh, size is small enough. Good morning. Um, so uh, one of the things we're going to need today, uh, you will need a Linux VM. Um, I'm going to be building this on Ubuntu. So I'm going to drop the uh, link here. Um, I, I created a GitHub repo for us. <clears throat> it's going to be um, Nathan McNulty slash ACPE. And then uh, in here, we have all the different command lines. So um, if you don't have a VM ready or it's not quite ready by the time we get started here, uh, you can come back here and kind of catch up, just copy and paste the commands. Um, we'll be stopping along the way kind of talk about what uh, each of the items are um, in here and kind of uh, just in general how Graylog works, um, how logging works, uh, some of those things. So you guys will be able to uh, kind of do some catch up. So I'm going to drop that link um, right there in that chat. Um, so you guys can go uh, grab that. And I've already deployed a Graylog server. Um, I'm just going to uh, SSH into that guy and uh, we can get started. Uh, a little bit about Graylog. Um, they uh, started as a branch off of Elastic Stack or Elk Stack, as a lot of people know it, a um, long time ago. Um, and they just didn't like the way that it ingested messages, didn't like the way that the platform worked. Um, and I really uh, found it easier to use. Um, Elastic Stack had moved over to a different query language. It wasn't as use intuitive for users. Um, and I think it's a really good fit for education where um, we don't, we don't have a lot of time to dive into uh, the 45 different components of a product, whereas this just has a few um, of like an elk stack. It's just, it's a it's a large beast. Um, and so at Beaverton School District, unfortunately I don't have access to um, the Greylog instance that I had there anymore. Um, so we'll be going through uh, my lab. Um, but even there, I only had two servers. I had one standalone Elasticsearch box and one standalone Graylog box. So um, kind of in a, at an architectural view, uh, there's there's great Graylog documentation. Um, and they kind of give you uh, an overview of how this works. So you have a, a firewall, you have a switch, you have uh, your Windows clients, whatever it is, right? It's going to be sending uh, some sort of audit logging, and it's going to come into Graylog. Graylog will uh, what we call ingest those messages, um, and then it does certain things with it. So we've got a MongoDB database. Um, that one, almost never touch it. It is uh, for all the configuration about Graylog. Um, Graylog basically has uh, a little API where you can configure, hey, I want to be able to listen to syslog on uh, 514 UDP, right? So we'd configure that in there, and that configuration gets saved into the MongoDB. Um, so you rarely ever touch that. Um, it's it's just for uh, the authentication of like uh, what users are allowed to access, what streams, and different things. And we'll jump into some of that. Um, so messages come into Graylog. Graylog does uh, it receives. It also does some um, normalization of the data. Uh, so it will extract data from the field. So it, in Syslog, you may have um, you know, your uh, destination port, your uh, from IP, you know, all that kind of stuff, your source IP, all, all that, that gets broken down into different fields. Um, and sometimes you have to write your own um, extractors, uh, something where it's like, hey, I know what these fields are supposed to be, and we'll map them in. Um, and so Graylog does all of that parsing of the data. Once it's got it, everything kind of broken down, um, it, it will just shove a whole raw thing into Elasticsearch, but um, you kind of want those uh, fields extracted so you can query on them. Um, and so that'll ship that over to Elasticsearch, uh, where Elasticsearch database will um, store a copy of that. 
Um, even at Beaverton, my, my instance wasn't high availability. I relied on the fabric of VMware. Um, so I didn't, it gets more complicated when you start adding nodes to the Elasticsearch cluster. Um, if you go to two, you should probably add a third and then, you know, it starts, it starts scaling out and, um, we just scaled up. So Elasticsearch kind of has a, uh, a limit of 32 gigs that you can, uh, put on it and it is going to be pretty memory heavy. Um, and then disk uh, and CPU are, are more minimal. Whereas on Greylog, um, you're a lot more CPU bound. Um, it's doing a lot of processing of messages. So it doesn't need quite as much memory as Elasticsearch. Um, so just for reference, we had, uh, I think it was roughly 3000 clients talking back to it, um, shipping, and uh, that included like firewall logs and different things. And we were up at about 600 gigs per day um, that we're ingesting before I kind of tuned it down, got it down to about 400, um, throwing away stuff that we didn't need and, and various different things. But it can handle that kind of workload um, up to even just having, uh, I think it was 16 gig um, on Greylog and then 32 uh, on Elasticsearch. Um, so then uh, the browser portion, you know, you just website. Um, so Greylog does host the website. Um, I recommend fronting it with a reverse proxy. And so we'll go over that um, little bit of setup too, whether it's Apache, Nginx, or I'll be using Caddy, um, which is a fun little uh, project. So anyway, that'll um, allow you to run queries against the Elasticsearch database. So this, of course, they're showing just a, all of it on a single combined server, which is how we'll build it today. Um, that's totally fine. If your uh, organization's probably, I don't know, five, maybe 10,000 students or less. Um, if you're getting any bigger than that, you probably want to split it out um, and have Greylog on its own dedicated server and then um, Elasticsearch on a, on a separate server. Uh, and having them talk together is not too terribly bad. And hopefully we'll touch base on that as we go through the configuration files. Um, so they kind of have a, an overall view here. If you, if you want to go to like a, a really large um, setup, uh, say we're uh, in ESD and we're going to be hosting a lot of instances or uh, we're going to be splitting it across places or, or whatever, you can actually deploy three of each and uh, kind of have load balancing in, in there. And um, it just starts adding complexity, which I find is um, always kind of a, I don't know, I always get bit by adding more complexity. So um, cool. So if we hop back over here, I'm going to uh, go ahead and get SSH'd into Greylog. Yes. I think I heard somebody. I should probably check the chat, make sure. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, hide the screenshot. Oh, screen share notification. Sure can. I didn't know that actually went through. Thank you. Um, cool. So we'll come back over here. Um, and remember, I got all these commands uh, over here on the um, GitHub repo. So we're going to walk through some prerequisites. Uh, there, it, there are docs, and they're they're really good docs um, over here on uh, Greylog's website. So docs.greylog.org. Um, that's where we were reading about the architectural. They've got it getting started. You can go to installing, and they have um, various options here. So uh, virtual machine appliance is really designed around a proof of concept. It, uh, to upgrade it and different things is really a pain. Um, so I wouldn't recommend doing that. Um, Chef Puppet Ansible, or sorry, Docker is uh, kind of a newer thing um, for them. They started that with like one of the later builds of three. Um, so it's just like not even a year. And uh, it's not, uh, I wouldn't start off with that. They're still pretty uh, new at doing that. Um, so I'd recommend probably sticking to something in here. Uh, Chef Puppet Ansible, if you're doing any automation with build, um, you can definitely do that. Those aren't updated very often either, the recipes. Um, I don't see one for four when I went and looked. So, um, you know, kind of best to just stick to the tried and true what they've been supporting for a long time. Um, a note on CentOS, uh, they do have Red Hat Enterprise um, that you can run it on as well. Um, and that uh, they changed the licensing. So you can actually run 16 of those in your environment for free. So if you want to have like the, the actual official one, since I believe CentOS is going away. So um, anyway, uh, we can hop back over here. Um, so the prerequisites, we're going to get a few things installed. Um, if you look at the installing gray log and we go to the Ubuntu uh, installation, we're going to see that they're they're pushing like OpenJDK 8. Um, but the newer versions of Elasticsearch, they, they recommend using version 11. Um, and so I've kind of customized a little bit of how I install some of this stuff because they're they're recommending older packages um, in their installation. 
and I might push a request up to their uh, docs, but um, they tend to hold back a lot on, on older things. Um, and then one of the other big gotchas that we'll cover is Elasticsearch. They finally added support for uh, version seven. So uh, version six was really old. Um, and with version seven, they uh, Elastic, the company who makes it, has actually made some changes in 7.11 that can break gray log indexing. Um, and there's some stuff you have to do to fix it and whatever else. So what we're going to do today, we're going to install Elasticsearch version 7.10.2, which is the um, most recent version uh, that Greylog officially supports. And they actually call that out in their installation and stuff, um, that, it's, that it doesn't support 7.11 and higher. They are working on it. So we're going to do a hold on that apt package. Um, and then we'll just do an unhold uh, when Elastics or Greylog finally adds support for the newer versions of Elasticsearch. Um, so we will have to hold back the database, unfortunately, for now. Um, so with that said, let's grab this guy, and we can come on over here, and I'll, I'll walk along with you guys. And hopefully I uh, talked and rambled on for long enough that maybe uh, VM might be close to ready if you decided to deploy one. Um, so first off, we're just going to check and make sure that there's you know updates. Oh. should probably switch to the root since we're going to be doing this for a while. OK. Uh, so no updates available, because I updated. I didn't want you guys having to wait for that. <laughs> um, and then we're going to install um, HTTPS transport. Um, so when we go and install our packages, we don't want it to go over HTTP. Uh, even though they are signed and everything else, there's still, I guess, risks there. Open JDK 11 and uh, a couple of other things that we'll use. So we'll do that. I did add the dash Y, so it'll auto install for us. Um, and we shouldn't have to like confirm for everything throughout the whole uh, process here. So we'll come back over here. Um, so outside of Java, we have MongoDB. Uh, and we're going to have to add a key for that um, to be able to pull that uh, list in. So we'll do that guy right there. And we've got the key. So we'll come back over here. And we're going to add the list. And then when we do our apt uh, update, we'll, uh, it'll actually update using this new list and check to see that against their repo. Um, and then when we go to install MongoDB, it'll pull the MongoDB install from their repo. So they do support version 4.2. Um, I'm installing version 4 because that's um, what they have in the documentation. And I had some weird issues last night uh, with 4.2 um, as I walked through this uh, process one more time. And so I just reverted it back to doing, doing 4. OK, so um, now that it's installed, we need to uh, basically reload the daemons, uh, enable the service, and then start the service. So um, before I started with Greylog and kind of the security stuff, I didn't really know a whole lot of Linux. Um, I still really don't. Um, but it, this has been a good learning experience. Most security tools tend to run on, on Linux, um, or they run better on Linux. Like Splunk, yeah, it runs on Windows, but they really recommend you run it on Linux. Um, so don't be too terribly uh, scared off by uh, running a Linux box here um, if you're really familiar with Windows. Um, there's not, it's not too terrible um, for this specific system, and it's a good one to learn on. So, um, so we're going to reload that and enable um, the service, and it should tell us that we're good to go. And um, we can do a system CTL a status. Oh, um, Mongo D to see that it is active and running. So, so we got that installed. Now we'll go and move on to Elasticsearch. So again, we're going to grab that key. And then we're going to add another list. And then uh, if you notice here, I'm calling out that um, 7.10.2 as the version that we're installing. So if you uh, do an app get or apt install um, and then specify a package name with an equals and then the um, version, that'll actually make sure that that specific version gets installed. And then here I'm doing an apt mark hold on Elasticsearch. So that's going to prevent it from uh, updating when we do apt update. Just double checking what that sound is here. Oh, Colleen, I think you might be getting a call. Here, that's it. Oh, there we go. 
Um, hopefully everybody can still hear me. Link to the docs, yes. Uh, cool. Yeah, it's, uh, I would not try to do WSL on that, Craig. Um, you're going to want uh, full performance on this, and I, I honestly don't know uh, how it handles like open files and different things like that. Um, it certainly wouldn't be supported. So, um, and Greylog does do uh, an appliance, Garen. It's just not, um, it's difficult to update. Um, so even if you do use their appliance, they've had issues doing the upgrades of the uh, of the appliance itself. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is funny uh, being so much on Windows and then I'm sitting here talking about Linux. Um, so cool, let's, uh, da, 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 system D, yep, okay, cool, good to go. So I'll come back over here, and um, if anybody knows more Linux than me, feel free to shout in the chat that I'm doing stuff wrong, so uh, I'm totally cool with that. Um, I honestly just, you know, futz my way through it, so. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and run that update, and we'll install Elasticsearch version 7.10.2, and then we'll verify that it did also um, start running. Um, and let's see here, there was one other thing that, oh yeah, here we go. So if you follow the guide for um, last, for the install here from Greylog, they recommend using a dash OSS. Um, and there, there are other components that we might want to leverage um, out of the, uh, the other Elasticsearch, like the real Elasticsearch from Elastico. Um, the OSS only comp contains the open source uh, components, not the proprietary components. Um, so if you're like a really big um, OSS fan, then you can do that. But um, anyway, one of the downsides is that also adds um, this command here uh, in their docs, they'll say auto create index false, um, but the uh, non OSS version actually requires these things. So I copied that already in here for you um, and we should be able to just toss that uh, in here. Um, so elastic search, it's loaded and inactive. Uh, did I not start it? No, I did not start it. Cool. Oh, right. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and paste that in. We're, um, we're going to be uh, basically taking this input and then dropping it into the Elasticsearch um, configuration file, which is a .yml, a YAML, um, under Etsy Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch YML. So if we nano that guy. Uh, yes, I do not use Vim or VI um, or Emacs. Uh, Sorry, Linux joke. There we go. Um, if we come on down here to the very bottom, we'll see the content that we just added is, is there. Um, there's some other things you can do in here, um, specifying which port that Elasticsearch listens on. Um, so if you're putting it on another box, uh, separate from Greylog, um, you can adjust which ports that it's listening on. Um, Discovery hosts is um, for if you have like a cluster um, and you can specify which one's my, uh, kind of the primary node in the startup. This uh, bootstrap um, locking memory uh, basically uh, allocates a certain amount of memory and locks it so that it, like balloon driver won't take it away or uh, something like that anyway. Um, so there's some little things here. And if you read through Elastics, uh, so Elastic Co, they actually make Elastic Search. Um, and we're just using that component. You can go and check out their documents and I'll, most of it will apply just fine to Greylog as long as you stick to the Elastic Search components. They have uh, Kibana and Logstash, which um, are the, um, and Elastalert and a whole bunch of other little pieces. Those are basically what Greylog replaces out of that. And so uh, Greylog is just using their database. So come on back over here. So then, now that that's in place and we've specified how to uh, actually start up um, uh, the database, we're gonna go ahead and reload the daemons again. We're gonna enable the Elasticsearch service and then we're gonna start the service. And it does take a little while for this one and it takes a while for Greylog to initialize. Um, there's a bunch of security stuff it does. There's, um, uh, that on that initial startup anyway, um, creating like keys and different things. So. All 
Um, cool. So uh, let's check and make sure that that actually started. And yay, we're active and running. So that's good. Cool. Uh, so the next step and last step is to install Graylog. Um, well, actually, I lied because we're going to do caddy too. So reverse proxy. You could use Apache or whatever if you want. Um, so we're going to grab their uh, repository. Um, they don't use the key method on this one. So we're going to. Oh, I guess that's not even the repository. That's just the installer. Or is it? Uh, no, it is. It's the repo. There we go. So uh, if you notice on uh, their docs over here, their default installation includes the enterprise plugins and the inter uh, Graylog enterprise uh, like integrations or whatever. Um, they do have an enterprise offering. It has a lot of dashboards and different things. Um, they have, they're actually moving to a SaaS model as well, so they can host it for you. Um, I, I just use the free um, most of the time. If I had to ask how expensive it was, it was too much. So um, we can strip those out of that uh, option there, and then we can install just the free components. It'll still show the uh, enterprise in the um, in the web interface, so we can still click on that and still see what uh, options it offers and uh, activate a license if we need to, and then we can add those later on um, if you decided that you really wanted to go with their uh, enterprise offerings. So while that's installing, I'm going to hop back over here and just check and see if anybody had questions. Yeah, nano forever. Uh, yeah, so you can use the VM image. Uh, it's actually built on VirtualBox, not on uh, VMware. And so there's some weird things if you do try to deploy it uh, to VMware that you have to kind of touch up, I think, um, related to the storage drivers. Um, and so anyway. Uh, yeah, Vim for life. I started a, uh, a war over here. <laughs> yeah. So cool. Head back over here. Um, so we, we still don't have Graylog enabled. So we're going to come back to, there's all my notes. Um, come back over here. OK, so there's a couple of things that we need uh, to put into the Graylog uh, configuration file before we uh, start up Graylog server. Um, so we're going to generate a password secret using this pwgen, and then the root password SHA2 uh, we're going to do via this. So we're going to want to pop open a little notepad um, so that when we oh, you can't really see it, but it's over here. Uh, so we can copy those off uh, and because we're going to use them inside of a, a comp file. And I, I'm terrible at the FGBG control Z thing to like bounce around in a shell. So I'm lazy. I'm just going to do it this way. So now you know my super secret password. I'm going to have to burn this whole thing down when we're done. Uh, so then we'll come on over here and grab this guy too. And this is uh, is going to be your password that you use to log in to Graylog for the first time. So the username will be admin, and the password will be whatever you put here. So super secret password, oh. right? And it'll give you basically a hash of what that is. So now I have a notepad with those two saved in it, right? And then we can go ahead and edit the. Um, we're going to nano the Graylog configuration file, the server comp file. So it's going to be slash Etsy, Graylog server, server comp. And uh, I cheat, control W uh, is where. Um, it'll search. So where is. And we're going to do, uh, what was that value? We're going to look at uh, password underscore secret. And you never touch this again. Um, most of the stuff during the setup for Linux, you, you don't end up touching after the fact. So um, if you wanted to change your ad default admin, you can change it to like, you know, Graybeard or something. So might be what I did with mine. Cool. 
So now that we've got that, control O, and uh, actually um, while we're here, take a, a little um, stroll through the configuration file. Um, <clears throat> It does use these like node ID files to, uh, if you scaled out to multiple and those are unique like GUIDs in them um, to basically differentiate the different nodes. Um, always use UTC uh, when logging, just always use UTC. Um, coming down here, we can actually specify what port we want it to bind on. Um, so by default, it's 9000 on the local host and um, I leave it that way and then use a reverse proxy in front of it. Uh, if you really wanted to, it does does support, uh, you can run it as root and bind it to 443 or use auth bind or something like that. And then it does support the ability to um, do certificates, which I think is going to be a little bit lower down here. Um, there's cores. It has some basic stuff. It's just not as performant as a reverse proxy. So here's where you'd put your certificates. So you could enable it and then have path to, the, um, to those and be able to bring it up. Um, the Elasticsearch hosts, again, if you have multiple um, hosts, then you're going to have to do that in here. By default, there is no authentication um, between the Elasticsearch host and the, um, and like if you expose it, because uh, you have it on a dedicated box. So you will have to either use like, um, like a firewall in front of it or um, lock it down. And uh, it's called XPack in Elasticsearch um, that has a bunch of like authentication components and you can use uh, certificates to uh, like um, do the mutual authentication between the two. Um, and it's uh, a lot more complicated. So um, we used VMware NSX uh, firewall rules and it was the only, Greylog was the only thing that could talk to it. And so that made it reasonably secure. Um, I did build one out with uh, certificates as well um, for Elastic Stack, and it is a pain. Um, so let's scroll down here just a little bit more. Uh, so this is all still the Elastic Stack stuff. I'm hope or search stack stuff. I'm hoping to find uh, there's how many uh, documents. So documents are there um, like messages that are being ingested. How many per index? And then um, this just gets saved into the uh, that MongoDB database, and then we can all customize all of that from the um, web interface once it spins up for the first time. It, it moves a bunch of this stuff into there. Um, but there are uh, things called processors. Um, same with this number of indices that we actually hold on to. Um, shards, uh, when we're splitting data out, think of this kind of like your um, RAID uh, level. So you've got RAID 5 or RAID 6, you've got you know two copies of your data in parity. Um, this is splitting your uh, data sets up. And then um, if you had multiple nodes, right, it's splitting these shards across multiple nodes and, and um, having replicas and different things like that. So that's if you start to scale out. Um, I'm just going to do a control D W cause I don't know where this is. Here we go. So they have these output batch. Uh, they have a uh, three different things. Uh, one's taking the messages in. So that's the, um, input buffer. Um, there's the processing, um, of the messages. So that's the process buffer. And then there's the output, um, where it sends stuff from gray log into elastic search. So that's the output. Um, so they, in here, they have how many, like, um, vCPUs that you're dedicating to it, um, how many uh, uh, how many items are getting sent out in a batch size, um, and here's the processors. Uh, so right now we've got VC five vCPU as their default, and then three vCPU dedicated to the output buffer. Um, and you can adjust all of these based on your needs. Um, for the most part, the input doesn't require a whole lot of CPU. Um, it's just taking messages in and queuing them. Um, and then we'll want to enable the journal, uh, which is, um, and I totally forgot to put that in the notes. So I'm going to make a quick note for myself to add that to the repo. Um, cool. Uh, so as it takes in messages, if the processor um, okay. buffer isn't handling the uh, amount of messages that are coming in, say um, Greylog had been turned off for a while and it boots back up and now all these clients see that, oh, it's available, let's start shoveling the data over there. Um, you don't want Greylog to sync or uh, lose all of those events. So it can actually um, push those off into a journal on the hard drive which you can specify the size that you want that to be and everything. And then uh, once it's received all the messages, it can start working through that backlog. Um, so the processors, um, 
the processor like um, Q, I should say, uh, that uses a lot of CPU to process through all the messages. And you can do all kinds of crazy stuff with what they call pipelines. So we'll cover those. Um, and then the output buffer um, is highly dependent on uh, your Elasticsearch. So you'll have to just play with those numbers um, from a networking standpoint and a resource usage on the Elastic. Um, I can ask uh, Justin or somebody over at BSD for the numbers that I had done, because um, I did a lot of a significant amount of tuning. Um, but if you want, you can steal my method. Uh, literally just take an old box, a uh, Windows box that's never been, um, like had a monitoring agent on it, and then just throw the gray log um, agent on there and let it ship its entire history. <laughs> And it will very quickly uh, send a lot of logs and uh, fill that up for you. And so you can just keep doing that with like lots of clients over and over. Um, and you can kind of tune it to the way that you want to get it working. So that was, I just wanted you guys to know where that is. Um, so uh, if you need to adjust those, you can come in here. Oh, it looks like the journal is enabled by default. So that's cool. Um, and anyway, so we shouldn't have to touch with the ring size or any of that kind of stuff. But if you do scale out, you can you can come in here and adjust some of those. And I recommend reading up on the so docs. Alan, on that. Is there someone that... uh, cool. So I don't think I modified anything in here. I don't know that I want to do that. Cool. Uh, well, we can move on here. Uh, let's go ahead and um, reload the daemon, start this service. And again, that'll take a little while. Oh. Oh, uh, did I actually start it? Yeah, I did. OK. It started way faster than I would expect, so I think we might have failed. Yep, we did. What did I do wrong? Cool. Who doesn't love a fail? Uh, so journal CTL XE, and let's look and see what we did. Promise I walked through this last night. By the way, all those uh, SDA failed whatever has to do with a UUID disk thing in VMware. So that's all just spurious. Well, let's check and see. Uh, MongoD is still running and active. Uh, Elasticsearch live troubleshooting. Look at this. Elasticsearch is running. And Greylock server's not, so. And it's taking, it's too fast. Um, oh, you know what? I know what I did. I didn't, I did actually need to save that because I had put in the secret or the password or whatever. There we go. Yep, that'll do it. So that would break it for sure. Cool. So let's try this again. I don't know if I did that in the right order, though. Oh, we'll find out. When I can't log in, we'll know. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. Uh, That's right. It's already going because it's got me listed as the. There we go. See, it should kind of hang and then make you wonder if it's actually going to come back. So that'll take about a minute. I'm going to hop back over here, just take a look while that's running um, and see how everybody's doing. Yeah, I like Nano, um, just easier to get out of. <laughs> um, yeah, so, man, uh, we looked at Splunk, and it was like $750,000. It was insane. Um, I don't know how much, like, paid Greylog is. Uh, Sim Monster is another really cool-looking one. Um, might be reasonable for you guys. Um, yeah, there's lots of different like uh, log uh, collecting, uh, like whatever Sentinel's cool too, Azure Sentinel, but it's expensive. 
Um, most of them just added up too much in cost. So um, when I looked at it, it was mostly Greylog or, or Elk Stack were the two options. And Elk Stack's just so complicated um, and so many options and features and stuff in there that um, it makes it hard if you want to invite other people to use it. Yep. I'll sure use a sea monster. Yeah. Yeah. Sea monster is cool. Um, it's a it's a nice platform for sure. Okay. So let's check and see if that actually came up now. Hey, cool. We're running. Yay. All right. So the last thing we want to do is uh, get a um, get a web server in front of this thing. Uh, we should actually be able to hit it. Let me. Just verify this. I know I launched Internet Explorer because I don't think either of my VMs are going to be loading up for me. And yes, I am doing via IP address because um, the new place, uh, DNS no worky on, on my network. So One kind of interesting thing of connecting via IP address is it fails down to NTLM instead of Kerberos. So try to use the machine name whenever possible. Uh, yeah, so that did not work, but it's okay. So if we go, gray log, port 9000. Um, nope, did not like that. Let's come back over here. I haven't enabled the firewall yet, so there's that. Um, you know what? Let's just go ahead and continue on with the um, with the install of. Uh, I'm going to do Caddy, but we'll add that list again. Uh, we're going to go ahead and update and install it. And I'm going to do so. We're going to take this configuration file here and uh, come back over here. And there's a under uh, Etsy caddy, there's a caddy file. So this is what um, kind of they give you as a, as a default. One of the neat things about caddy is if you do have, um, uh, if like in a cloud VM or whatever, and it's able to talk to Let's Encrypt, it will automatically go out and grab a Let's Encrypt certificate and automatically set up the certificate and everything for you. Um, so if you don't want that, you need to make sure to edit their configuration file to turn that feature off um, or bring your own certificates and specify them in the file, which is what I've done here. And so I'm gonna take just a quick second to uh, bring those certificates over, but I'm going to, um, cause I reverted my VM and of course blew away the certs, uh, didn't even think about it. So I'm gonna remove that and then we'll edit our own. We'll drop that uh, configuration in there. And then I don't know if it actually matters for, the, for their syntax, it's pretty easy, but they do at least usually kind of have those indented. I couldn't figure out how to make Markdown do that for me, so. Um, so we notice that it's under Etsy Caddy certs is where I usually put them. So um, there's not a certs folder, so we're going to um, make that. And then in here, I need a uh, my certificates. So let's do this. Um. 
So we're gonna, I'll show you what I'm doing here. Um, I'm on my firewall now uh, and I need to actually come back up here and rip a tab out. So I don't remember the path to get to that. So OpenSense is uh, pretty cool. It's kind of like PFSense, um, and they have a Let's Encrypt application. And so that actually retrieves all of my certificates for me. Um, that's not where I wanted to go, though. Yeah, var. There we go. Acme client home, and then Greylog. And there we go. So I'm going to do the uh, thing I'm not supposed to do. We're going to cut out some certificates, and we'll just copy them over because I don't, I can't SCP between these two boxes right now because of my firewall. So um, we'll come back over here, and we're going to nano uh, cert.pim, and we'll paste that guy in there. We'll save that guy. So you can bring your own certs. You can use HTTP if you want instead, um, just for the initial setup. Um, and actually, uh, while I mention it, just double check and make sure that didn't come up. No, oh, weird. I don't understand. Um, so then there's a key.pim. And now you know my private key too. Oh my goodness. You're gonna hacks on me. So we'll copy that guy over too. All right, and now we should be able to I'm trying to think if I need to change permissions on that or not. I don't think so. I didn't put it in the docs, right? Uh, cool. Oh, I didn't even put the. Well, we're supposed to restart the service. So, uh, system CTL restart caddy. And let's check and see that it did start. Yay. So now I should be able to, oops, uh, where am I going? Here. Hit this on HTTPS and have it actually work. Hey, cool. Look at that. Oh, I know why, um, why Greylog wasn't working on port 9000 because it was only listening on localhost, which of course I can't hit localhost from off the box. I would have had to make some changes there. And then this is not going to work um, because Internet Explorer is awesome. So let's hop over to my uh, VMware. And we're going to come to this guy. Just another way to go about it. Mr. Admin. There we go. Maybe there's a reason I can't RDP into it. Oh. Cool. Well, I'm waiting for some of that stuff to fire up. Uh, let's come back over to our docs. And so that should be the end of getting Greylog set up. It is up and running. Um, just Internet Explorer wasn't showing it for us. So uh, we're, we're done with kind of the, the big meat of it, of getting that kind of stuff all set up. So um, here, let's, oh, that's right. I was in VMware. We can check out Greylog kind of secure. Hey, there we go. So now admin and super secret password. Hey, look at that, we're in. So this is great log. Um, of course, we're on the latest version here, uh, but just kind of uh, in general, you've got your search and this is where you'll spend most of your time. Of course, I don't have any logs yet um, because we just did it up. 
And so to get your uh, logs going, we'll be uh, creating some inputs. And inputs are uh, basically like, hey, let's open a TCP port or a UDP port and accept some messages from other stuff. And if we take a look under here, you can get it from AWS. Uh, Beats is Elastic um, Co. So they, they make the Elk stack. Um, they also make these Beats inputs. Um, and they have lots of really neat ones. Prior to um, them moving to version seven of Elasticsearch, we were stuck with just FileBeat and WinLogBeat um, and AuditBeat, I think. Um, now there's a whole bunch of them. So you can do like metrics and um, packet beats where you can like uh, grab all the DNS packets off of stuff. So you can toss that on all your Mac clients and have them ship just DNS queries. Um, lots of really cool stuff. Uh, so Graylog hasn't really updated their templates to support the newer beats. Um, that they now support, but it might get added in. Um, hopefully, we have enough time here um, at the end, and we can go over how to actually add support for like an audit beats or something. Um, but CEF, very common uh, common event format. Um, GELF is a proprietary um, format that, that Greylog developed to get around some of the limitations of syslog. Um, what's interesting and important to note is if you do have a Mac installation base using Jamf, uh, Jamf uh, ran Greylog internally. Um, and so Jamf actually developed their uh, software to use GELF. Um, so you can actually tie that in. And we had uh, alerts fire off when certain policies were created um, uh, for, for various scopes and stuff. So um, pretty cool what you can do in there with that. Um, it can pull down JSON from uh, an API, say, um, you know, Zoom or something along those lines. Uh, Palo Alto, they do have the different uh, formats for these. So by selecting these, it um, it configures how to parse the data that's coming in. It says, hey, I, I know what format it's supposed to be in. I know how to map everything from the door, destination, the source, um, IPs and ports and app ID and, you know, all that data. Um, and so that, that pre-configures that for you and makes it really easy. Um, and then, of course, there's plain text, which is just a raw network port, and we can just throw data at it. So this is what I actually used for doing Zoom. Um, and if we, uh, I think I published it actually in my, um, oh, I'm in the full screen. That's fine. Uh, GitHub, Nathan McNulty. And if we come to the repositories and look at mine uh, in Zoom, I have a PowerShell script that uh, I don't actually have it published. So cool, I will publish that. But um, I wrote a PowerShell script that would actually grab the, the logs uh, out of Zoom and then uh, basically shove them at the uh, raw input um, and it would and then parse them all inside of Graylog. So I'll try to get that up there. Um, so that's how you can use those. Uh, you can use Netcat off of a Linux box or something and Netcat data over as well. Um, and then syslog is the one that we're going to be the most familiar with, right? And, um, I'm not smart enough to know uh, really the big differences between TCP, UDP on, on syslog itself. I, uh, from what I understand, if you have high volume traffic, TCP can cause uh, everything to slow down because it has to wait. Um, so if you've got like a firewall and it's sitting there trying to shovel data and it's not accepting it, it can cause uh, CPU pr like processing issues over on the firewall side. So um, that's, that's about all I know about it. Um, so if we create this UDP input, we can say like, hey, let's call this our uh, firewall, right? Um, or actually, not firewall, let's name it uh, UDP syslog UDP. So I'm gonna wanna shove more than just the firewall at this thing. Um, so we'll save that. And uh, now we've got an input, which is really cool. So we can start that input. And if I exit out of this guy and come back over to my firewall, and um, I bet you I'm logged out and this is just cached. Yep. Um, so in here, logging targets, and we can do this for ESXi as well or anything else that does syslog. Um, but I've configured this to send to the IP and save and apply. And hopefully we should be able to come back over to Graylog. And assuming things are working, No data. Uh, no, that's not going to be it either. No data in or out. Let's check the input. Oh, it failed. Oh, you know what? <laughs> I know why. 
Uh, okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, 514 is a privileged port on Linux. So if it's under 1024, it will fail. The Linux guys are laughing at me now. Um, just teasing. Um, we'll double check on this. Uh, yes, um, actually, we are using Caddy uh, in prod on a few things. Um, I, interestingly enough, we have something that, um, because of the way that it was built, doesn't really support proper uh, TLS. And so we threw Caddy into the mix in front of it to um, allow us to basically make sure everything was running TLS 1.2. Um, and it, it works really well uh, for that as a reverse proxy. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, OK, so we're going to switch gears just a little bit um, and switch over to Windows uh, Advanced Audit Logging. So um, one of the things that's interesting, let's go ahead and hop over to 81 here, and I'll open Group Policy. And we can take a look at all the stuff that's not enabled by default. Um, there's a lot of events that um, I'm not sure if it's just concerns around performance issues, uh, everybody's environment is unique, um, or what exactly the thought process is here. But we'll call this advanced auditing. And sorry if I'm going quick. Uh, there's just a lot of content. It's fun to cover. And uh, there's a video being recorded. So we should be able to come back and reference most of this stuff. Um, and hopefully that'll, that'll work out. Um, so this is kind of the, the harder mode, um, though it's still recommended to have these audit logs enabled. Um, so let's see if I can actually remember where it is, because I didn't think to walk through this part. Yeah. Cool. So there's this advanced audit policy configuration section. So you've got a, a normal audit policy um, that has to do with like uh, the event log um, and specifying like how big the security log is, the application log, some of these things. And you definitely want to bump up the size of your security log. Um, it is a file memory mapped, I guess, um, that Eric discovered. And so when I set it to two gigs, that was not cool because apparently it just like used two gigs of RAM. Um, <laughs> so set set to something reasonable. Um, but anyway, so there's those. And then if you come down here, we've got all these different advanced audit policies. So hey, I want to know when a TGS is, is requested or whatever. Um, if I'm doing directory services access, I want to know, you know, when I'm, when something was changed. I want to know when it replicated. Um, none of these things are actually enabled by default. Um, that's not showing everything. Hang on. There we go. Um, so auditing log on, log off, uh, IPsec tunnels, and all kinds of other stuff. And so this can be really overwhelming, looking through all the different options and wondering what in the world am I supposed to enable um, to actually get decent auditing. So over here, I actually threw a few links for us to kind of review. Um, more, you can go, kind of go over these and make best judgment um, for, for what you're expecting to get out of Greylog. If you're looking to really use it as a security tool, um, a lot of these things should be enabled. So malware archaeology has some really cool um, like cheat sheets. So this is the Windows logging cheat sheet. This is the one that I would kind of start with. And they walk you through each of these different items. OK, so hey, your your log sizes, let's make sure that we're specifying the right size. Um, so 512 meg or, uh, or a gig. Um, and talking about DNS logs and some other various different things. But here's our advanced audit logging. So now you know where that is um, over here under in our group policy. We can configure that under um, Windows security settings advanced audit policy, and we've got all these options. So that's where these map to. And you can see kind of what their recommendations are um, to ensure that you're collecting the proper logs. Um, that uh, So this company, they do digital forensics and investigations and stuff, incident response. Um, so they're post-breach. This is all the stuff that they basically tell their customers, hey, um, you know, if you actually had this stuff, it would have made our lives really easy, and you probably would have detected things. Um, so going through and configuring all of these as they've kind of recommended um, is, is helpful. And they do have, if you don't have um, uh, Active Directory or Group Policy or whatever, or you've got like a standalone box, uh, say your backups is AD detached, but you still want to have all these policies, you can actually um, do that via command line as well. And so they've got some of those uh, details in here on how to do that. 
um, using audit Paul and, and reg keys and all this different stuff. Um, so things to kind of monitor on and um, their recommendations on what you should harvest um, as far as like, um, hey, look for these specific event IDs. So um, a lot of that has to do with like what to collect now that you've enabled all of this auditing. Um, so there's just so, so much that Windows does not audit by default. And so you, if you have a malware attack, you're, you're not going to see it unless you've actually enabled a bunch of this stuff. Either, even if you are monitoring your logs, you're just not going to see the stuff you need to see. So, so we know that's there. Palantir is, uh, oh, actually there's an advanced one too, has a lot more content. And then if you are using like, um, there, there's a whole bunch of these in here, right? So uh, Sysmon logging cheat sheet is great too. Um, so there's just a whole bunch of things you can kind of go through and take a look. So LogMD is another one. Um, oh, we'll get to that. Well, let's just do that one. Uh, no. Um, why did it not work though? That's weird. It's always DNS. No, it worked that time. Weird. Um, so LogMD is the easy mode of those cheat sheets. It's a little application that you can run, and it will automatically um, uh, configure all of those settings on your client. So you can push this out. Um, it's very, very inexpensive. Um, so the, the two guys, they work together. Um, so the guy who actually wrote this works for a certain company, and then the other guy who does the cheat sheets, he works for a different company, but they work together and they build all this stuff together. Um, so anyway, this is a pretty cool tool. Um, and I've used it in my lab. We did not end up using it at the district, um, mostly because of Defender for Endpoint and not really needing to do this. Um, so something about Sysmon and Defender for Endpoint and any other um, uh, EDR, I guess, um, is that they talk to lower level resources to query that kind of information. They call them like ETW providers and stuff. Um, so they don't actually like read the event logs themselves. They're hooking into the same stuff that the event logs are hooking into in order to write those event logs. So a little bit different. Um, but again, there's a performance impact to that, whereas just shipping event logs is a lot cheaper than having another device, another application that's querying those uh, providers. So you have some performance on your endpoints and stuff. So Palantir is a very, very large security company. Um, I don't even know if I'm saying the name right, but uh, they have on here a whole recommendation as well um, for uh, all of those different policies, as well as some other ones that may not be in the cheat sheets, um, like being able to audit all of your NTLM traffic. Um, so one of the things about NTLM, most people don't realize, NTLM has your password in it. Um, it can be cracked very trivially, uh, trivially with Hashcat um, and or Jack the Ripper or any of the other tools. Um, so if you're passing or if you're connecting to stuff like say RDP over an IP address um, and there's an attacker is able to obtain that NTLM hash, uh, they can actually crack your domain admin password pretty quick and easy. Um, so most of your admin accounts should be in what's called the protected users group in Active Directory. Um, that is located, oh, I don't have the Active Directory console open. Um, this is just kind of a side note, little bonus. Uh, but come down under users and there's, if, assuming that you're on 2012 R2, which, uh, or newer, which I really, really hope um, at this point you are. Um, protected users group, where is it? Yeah, there we go, protected users group. So this group will harden Kerberos. It'll uh, remove the ability to use NTLM, but it also breaks uh, delegation, Kerberos delegation. So being able for uh, like a, a web app to relay the Kerberos ticket for a user over to a SQL box um, so that it can authenticate as that user instead of uh, having to use a credential from the web app itself, right? Um, so it'll break all those things. So if you're using domain admin um, to perform uh, regular functions, it's probably time to switch over to using a least privilege admin account, um, uh, like a, just a generic server admin, and then leave the domain admin stuff alone. Um, so that means adding uh, that server admin to the local admins on some of the other servers or adding it to whatever appropriate groups, um, trying to get that kind of ironed down. But NTLM's bad. Um, that's the story. Uh, and there's actually a zero potato, remote potato zero, I think. Um, super fun. Anyway, remote potato zero, here you go. Um, so this exploit was just dropped like eight days ago. Um, no, interesting. Um, 
anyway, it's not going to be patched by Microsoft, and it makes it very trivial um, to get uh, uh, NTLM hashes from people without even having user interaction, which is just terrible. So I expect Microsoft to change course on their decision to not patch this. Um, but just be aware, uh, this is like 15 minutes to domain admin uh, type deal there. So uh, again, NTLM is bad. Um, so anyway, if we scroll through here, you'll notice all these advanced audit policy things. They, I don't know exactly how they shore up against the malware archaeology list, um, but that's they have their recommendations on what you should configure. And Palantir is kind of a, a the largest like a managed security provider, um, so they have really good recommendations from like really expensive <laughs> large environments. Um, so it's it's great, and they put out some really really good materials for people. Um, so you can kind of scroll your way through uh, all this and kind of decide. And they, they do break some of them out based on like, hey, for your member servers, do this. For your, uh, yeah, so member server versus uh, standard server versus um, uh, workstations or whatever. So. Um, so Defender for Identity, if you happen to have um, licensing for what used to be Azure ATP, they actually also specify, and there's a little bit of, of a GUI for you to kind of look at of where to configure these audit policies for the advanced audit configuration, and then they specify what event logs they need. Um, the because they're running on a domain controller for this, um, they want to just scrape event logs instead of talking to those low-level low providers. They're already doing a lot of heavy lifting around networking stuff on the uh, domain controllers, um, analyzing the networking traffic and stuff. And so there was a decision made, uh, kind of a compromise to not have to hook into that on a domain controller and, and you know, potentially cause issues. So um, they're just scraping those event logs. So you have to enable that if you happen to roll uh, Defender for identity. So obviously anything in that list is probably pretty important. And then uh, now you've got like thousands of event logs and how do I actually know uh, which ones are important? Well, NSA has a really nice uh, guideline. They're leaving out the ones that they want to use, you know, to attack. Um, no, that's the FBI, that's right. Um, so anyway, you can scroll through that and decide what you want to ship um, back into your, uh, into your gray log or whatever you're using. Um, so uh, there, there's a couple of other ways, a couple of ways you can get the logs into Graylog. Um, one of them is you can deploy that sidecar with the agents, the logging agents, onto each of your clients, onto each of your servers, and um, now you've got this extra piece of software that's running on all of those. Um, if you don't have a great way to deploy software, um, or like you, it's just difficult to get like group policy working properly on all this stuff, or you have like a lot of Macs or something along those lines. Well, this won't for, work for Macs, but um, there is Windows Event Collection and uh, Windows Event Forwarding. And so um, if we take a look here, um, I have this Windows Event Forwarding. Actually, instead of doing it that way, we're just going to look at the settings. Um, so it's a pretty simple setup. Um, it's one configuration policy. Well, one one little piece under adv administrative templates, Windows components, event forwarding. You s configure this subscription manager, and you specify the server that they're supposed to that the clients are supposed to talk to to receive information about what they're supposed to send uh, or what they're supposed to forward. So then over here on this server um, that that's correlated to. <clears throat> Uh, when you first right click or click on this, it says something about like, hey, Windows Event Collector is not enabled. Do you want to enable it? Cool. Say yes. Um, if you're running 2016 um, or 2019 or newer, there's actually the, there, I'll find the KB article and I can share it, but um, you actually have to delete the uh, the permissions on, the, on this endpoint, the uh, WS man. You'll have to delete it and then rewrite uh, the permissions on it because by default only administrators can talk to it, and then you need to add additional stuff to allow a computer to actually talk to it. So um, that's 2016 and above. They hardened the uh, protocol so that only admins could talk to it, and so we'll have to adjust that. So um, anyway, once you've done that, the client actually reads whatever configurations you put in here, and then the client starts forwarding whatever event logs that you specified. So if I I wanted to specify a computer that I want to have the computer actually push rather than this collector, this server uh, polling. So those are the two different methods you can do. You can specify um, 
what events you want to have it ship. And so on this example, I'm using Sysmon. So um, I, I'm just pulling all of the Sysmon logs back into this, and then it is placing it um, into the forwarded events um, event log. We can create all kinds of custom ones if we want in here and then forward different things into them. So we could have like a folder of forwarded events. And then inside of that, we could have, you know, Sysmon and security and different things like that. Um, but when things get pulled through, uh, let's come back here. It'll actually show the uh, computer name uh, along with it. So when we put the file beat on this one, or the win log beat agent, the gray log logging agent on this one box, now that's the only thing that needs to send data back into gray log. So that can be really helpful if you don't want to open up a whole bunch of ports and different things, and then you can basically lock it down so that only your uh, Windows event collector is shipping those logs back into gray log. So since I mentioned Sysmon, that's a good, uh, good little segue over into that. Um, so let's come back over here and Sysmon. Sysmon is going to be a really quick section. Um, Sysmon is a Microsoft Sys internals um, project. Actually, the guy who is now the lead architect and like manager and everything for Azure, um, Mark Rusinovich, is uh, he created all these uh, Sys internals tools way back in the day, and Microsoft was like, that dude's really smart. Uh, we need somebody smarter, like that smart, you know? And so they hired him and bought all his stuff or whatever. Um, so you can come on over to the Sysmon downloads and grab a copy of that. One thing to know though is Sysmon will um, really tank performance if it's not uh, like configured um, because it will just literally sit there and collect everything. It's a, it's a great system monitoring tool, um, but it needs to have a configuration file that kind of uh, reduces some of the noise because some, uh, some applications, especially like the Linnell Security Manager, it requests elevated permissions every, like I think it was a thousand times per second or something ridiculous. Um, so I had to actually make a special exception in there for Sysmon not to try to um, review that. Um, and so anyway, uh, we have these configuration files. Um, let's come back over here. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. So Sysmon actually takes like, uh, it talks to all those low-level providers, right? It can aggregate probably a dozen or so um, events and all, they're all automatically correlated and everything. And the way that it presents the data is much nicer than most of the other event logs. Um, so I'd be comfortable relying just on Sysmon. Um, so if you're trying to simplify this deployment and you want um, something really easy, uh, here, 22, I believe, is DNS query. So, hey, cool, look at that. I've got a DNS query and it shows what I actually queried against uh, 81. I'm looking for that server. Um, here I can see like, uh, oh, I, I requested a, cr a privileged token and it collects all this information with it. Uh, for a Windows update uh, or definition update. Um, so event ID one is like I started a process. Um, so all these different things, um, it'll ship all of that data in here along with hashes, which then allows you to take those hashes and you can go to virus total and just paste the hash in and search and see if it's malicious. Um, it's super powerful. Um, and a lot of, there, there are entire EDRs based on Sysmon. Um, they use it to read it and then they parse the data that it puts out. So talking about configurations um, that you need to pass to it, it's an XML file. It has a certain rule set, and they have all of that uh, detailed down here. Um, so they have their uh, the events, what all events it actually collects, and it collects tons of stuff, um, whether or not a driver was loaded, um, named pipes, uh, where those pipes go. Anyway, the named pipe stuff is really big. Yeah, here we go. Um, querying based on those will tell you that somebody's running Cobalt Strike um, on your stuff which is um, a very popular tool for a lot of the ransomware gangs. Um, so there's some new events that are <laughs> really cool. It'll actually um, capture a copy of deleted files. So if an attacker drops on a box and then runs a bunch of stuff and then deletes their files, um, you would usually not have anything left to go back against to kind of do investigation. So this will actually copy into a protected folder um, and make a copy of those files. can also monitor clipboard. Um, and then process tampering is an interesting um, uh, kind of newer attack. Uh, interestingly, you can apply a WDAC policy, like a application control policy of allow, allow, uh, or allow all, basically. 
it, and it breaks this. I don't know why, but it's kind of cool um, by just making the most permissive policy, it ends up breaking um, process tampering entirely, and then it just doesn't even work on your system. So um, anyway, so here's their configuration file, uh, what those configs look like, um, and uh, like kind of, hey, if we see a network match uh, port 443 or port 80, right, um, we want to include that event. But if it also ex in, uh, ends with iExplore.exe, then we're going to exclude that. If it's if it's matching Internet Explorer, we want to drop that. Um, so he has a whole set of documentation on how all of this stuff works, um, but I find it easier to just do uh, somebody else's configuration. So the two most popular ones, Swift on security, not updated as often. Um, Swift is great, um, kind of uh, interesting character, um, very fun, uh, lots of. Uh, references to planes and corn and furries and stuff, but um, lots of really good knowledge uh, that they share on Twitter and stuff. So, um, yeah, even they recommend uh, Olaf's Sysmon modular. Um, so this uh, export uh, config XML file, that's what we would consume, and we can kind of click in that and see what it looks like. It's very, very long, and it's hard to um, edit. Um, so this is what I originally started with, but I mean, every time that I wanted to do something with Teams, it's, you know, control F, and I'm searching for Teams, and oh, it's in like four different places, and, you know, all this stuff. And so um, Olaf Hartong, um, he creates a Splunk app that actually consumes off of this and then maps all of the attacks to the MITRE attack framework and some really cool stuff. Um, but anyway, you'll notice he's got all these folders, uh, one for each of the event IDs, um, or maybe sometimes aggregating them. But it makes it a lot easier if, hey, I'm, I'm really concerned about event ID one. Oh, okay, cool. I'm just coming in here and now I can actually break them out by the software that I'm actually running. Um, so by default, when you run his little PowerShell command, it'll just rip through all the XML files that are in here. So you can delete the ones that you don't want or modify them or whatever. Um, but he's got the little, you know, you can clone the repo and then you run his merge sysmon XML PS1 and it'll it'll drop out, um, run that and it'll drop out an XML file for you to use. You can optionally just download it straight from here. So if I come on over here um, and I take a look at the desktop, it might be what I've already done. <clears throat> so sysmon64 and sysmon config, and then when I run my command line, it is that guy right there. So sysmon64-i is an install, and then, and then I can specify config file and accept EULA. So you can push that out via config manager, via group policy, via whatever you want to use, and then just specify full paths on all that stuff. and then. In the future, if you want to update that config file, because uh, Olaf's really good, he actually updates his weekly, easily weekly, whereas Swift is maybe, I don't know, once every few months. Um, <clears throat> so uh, you'll start to get a hang of the syntax and everything, but um, that'll allow you to, uh, you can do a dash C. So this gets installed to C with uh, Windows System 32, and then there's going to be a Sysmon64 executable that controls the driver, and it talks to that driver and collects that information that we're using. Um, a dash C will uh, update the configuration file. So you could easily have a startup script that runs dash C off of uh, the sysvol um, for a config file or somewhere else if you want it a little more private. Um, and then accepting the YOLA you only have to do during the installation. If you leave that off, it'll just prompt you, and then you can click I accept. Um, and so that's that's what Sysmon's all about. <clears throat> um, if you do anything, I would just do Sysmon and leave the advanced audit policy stuff alone. Um, the advanced audit policy stuff is great to touch on, but um, Sysmon's going to be uh, just so easy to work with for you. Uh, one of the other cool things with uh, both of these configs is um, they have these rule hits. Um, so I don't know if I actually, I do have it here. Those are all the excluded rules. Where's this config? There we go. So here, rule name, event viewer bypass UAC. So one of the neat things is once this data is ingested into Graylog, we can actually query based on the rule hits. So we can say rule uh, is, um, you know, rule equals whatever this or is like this, and we'll be able to find those rules um, when they're uh, those are kind of more 
uh, actually you can do ex if exists rule and it'll say, oh yeah, there was data in that field. Those are a little bit more important uh, events to kind of look at. Um. <clears throat> okay, I went to the wrong one. So the gray log sidecar, um, I haven't done the install on this part yet, uh, but the gray log sidecar, um, well, actually I did do on one of them. Um, gray log sidecar is a little, it has the two agents, the winlog beat and the file beat agents, um, and then it has the ability to control uh, those. I'm gonna see if I can hop on one of my, yes, cool, now let me connect. There we go. Okay, so um, here. Well, that's not good. Screen's too. Uh, there we go. Sidecars. Um, and then in here, uh, this is the sidecar. It's basically where, the, like with the WEC, uh, where we created those subscriptions, this is where you're creating the configurations for the, for the devices. Um, it's weird. Oh, I know why. Okay, cool. So uh, to get started with the sidecar, we do have to create an API. So we're going to call this sidecar, and we'll create a token, and we'll copy that to the clipboard. And then I'm going to come back over here, and I'm going to go. There we go. Um, okay. So I've got the sidecar installer here. Um, let's see if I can remove it from the machine first. This is from when I was doing the run through test. Okay. So normally you'd push this out with, uh, you know, group policy or or whatever it is. Oops. Uh, which one am I on? So if we specify like this, you can do a silent install slash s, specify the server URL, and then we're going to do the API token. And it's pretty quick. Um, it's not a very big installer. I think it's like 100 megs or something. Oops. Oh, 60. Um, they don't currently sign their installer, so yeah, uh, the browser will complain about downloading it. Um, so it gets dropped here, program files, uh, gray log, sidecar. And then the side, sidecar YML file um, will get updated. Um, and here we should see our, our token and the location. Uh, here we go, there it is. Um, so the server URL. And then if we come back over to uh, our gray log install and come back to sidecars, should be here. Oh, uh, you know why? We don't have an input yet. So let's create a beats input and we'll call this beats input. 5044 is above 1024, so it'll allow us to um, bind to that without any problems. Uh, and then if you want to protect it with a TLS certificate so that it's uh, TLS encrypted, you can actually do that, and that's what we did at Beaverton. Oh, um, there was one other thing in there uh, that I, I prefer to change. Um, this do not add beats as a prefix, so all of your... Um, all of your events as they come in and are ingested, they end up with this filebeat underscore or winlogbeat underscore or whatever. And then you have to go ahead and 
basically modify the field names so that if you're trying to search for um, source underscore IP, that they all show source underscore IP. So that's a little bit of that normalization of data. You've got to think a little architecturally about all the data sources you're pulling in and how you want them to look so that when you do a query, you can actually run a query across, say, all your firewall logs, all your Windows workstation logs, and all of your um, you know Linux logs or something like that. Um, so the names you're going to want to have match so that when you search, it'll show the events across all of those different devices for, say, a given IP address. So we'll start that guy. And then we should see a client pop in there. Um, maybe. Oh, you know what? The service hasn't started because um, I didn't finish the actual like thing here. So you do have to install the service, and then you have to start the service. And you only have to do that once, and then it starts ever after that. So now, uh, let's see here, sidecars. Oh, there we go. So now I've got my sidecar in here. Um, and if we manage this, uh, we can see I have three different options right now, WinLogBeat, NXLog, and FileBeat, um, because those are the three that are configured for Windows. Um, I don't. Uh, we can leave the default, um, but let's take a look and see what the default looks like. So there's this configuration section, and here's where we're uh, defining the default template for our collectors. So they have FileBeat and NXLog for Linux, and then they have FileBeat, NXLog, and WinLogBeat for Windows. Um, so if we edit, say, the WinLogBeat here, and take a look at this uh, default setting. Um, these are the three event logs that we're going to be collecting. They specify the uh, the host name, which is uh, incorrect. Um, so we're going to want to update that. Uh, and then uh, say we want to collect the those the sysmon logs, right? Um, we're going to come back to. Maybe someday. <laughs> Do I have it open already over here? Save myself some time. Uh, Microsoft, Windows, and Sysmon is where the Sysmon log goes. So if we do a properties on that sysmon log, this name right here, and you can do this for any of the event logs that you want. So like I would recommend the Defender one and some of the others, and those are in the NSA guidance and some of the other um, resources that are there. They'll specify any of these, but if we're just keeping it real simple and just collecting sysmon, which is great, um, and it's helpful from a um, sysadmin to security standpoint, like I just want to know when these things are happening. Um, uh, event failures, when processes are starting, just investigation type stuff, troubleshooting. Um, that can be helpful. So we're going to copy that guy, and we'll come back over to our gray log. Um, we can close this because I don't need that. And then we're going to add that and just say update. And now all of the clients that are using this configuration, they will all automatically update and start pulling this in. Um, I can ask for my config uh, from the district. I had some pretty cool like processors that said, hey, um, you know, I want I want these event logs like the security log, but I want to drop certain events because on a file server, this uh, you know this access doesn't matter. Or um, on the endpoints, I can't collect that much data because um, it'll just totally blow up the uh, the Elasticsearch database, and I can't store all that. So I'll leave all my firewall logs, for example, um, the pl Windows platform filtering logs that says like, hey, I accepted a connection, or I established a connection, or whatever, and, and doing that across all of them would be like a terabyte a day of data. And so I just left those. So I, I, you'll want to be able to add some exclusions to some of these things, um, depending on what you're collecting back. So now that we've updated that um, template, if we want, we can create a configuration based off of one of those. So we could say, like, hey, let's call this WinLogBeats clients. 
And we're going to say this is a uh, Win Windows, and it'll automatically copy that template. And then you can customize this if you want. And then now I've got an additional configuration. So you can start to tune some of those configurations for servers versus like special workstations that have weird issues. Or maybe it's your point of sale, and they have SQL on them, and you got to do something special about that. You can start building these uh, configurations. And then that lets you come over here and check the box for the um, for the machine and specify which configuration you want it to use. So here we'll confirm, and we're going to go ahead and apply the Winlog Beats client. And it's questionable as to whether it's running, which isn't good. Nope. Cool. So under inputs, I should see now that I have a client connected, uh, one active connection, which is great. Um, and then we still have the syslog UDP over here that's kind of borked. Um, and so uh, let's come back to, so we're done with the gray log sidecar. And here's our configuration. And I did add this off bind section. Hey, look at that. So offbind is a way to allow us to grant um, kind of admin or sudo, I guess, I don't know, um, to uh, applications to allow them to bind to ports. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it does way more than just that. And the Linux guys can yell at me. Um, so there is one minor thing. You need to tell Graylog server that it's supposed to use that. So there's this Graylog uh, command wrapper here. And we're going to want to drop that content. Um, oops. This right here. So this off bind needs to go inside of that. And then we need to grant. Uh, permissions on those. So there's all of these commands. Um, so this is uh, TCP um, for, uh, 514, uh, which is going to be your standard syslog. And, and then uh, I think, I don't know which one's which, actually. Um, I think the exclamation mark is TCP, and then the non is UDP. But somebody can scream in the, um, in the chat there. <laughs> I'll come back and look at that in a second. Um, so there's that. Uh oh, I forgot the uh, shoot. OK, cool. It did not bring the, um... oh, maybe I didn't do it. OK, well, those uh, with the exclamation marks, they're going to need to have that around it, the ticks, because of the exclamation mark. So let's try that. There we go. Now it's more happy. No, no more complaining about dash. So now we just restarted Graylog with these new commands um, where it actually does the auth bind and all that. And then if we come back over to our client and uh, we take a look in here, which it probably make me log in again, or it's still starting up. I'll have to wait a minute for it to come back up, which is a good time for me to check the chat. Cool. Perfect, Jamie. <laughs> uh, so those GPOs will apply to whatever it is you want to collect, Josh. Um, so uh, we had um, policies for the domain controllers because they had additional things that we wanted to log. Um, and then we had a little bit less on some of the clients because performance impacts um, do expect a 1% to 5% performance hit, um, depending on what all you're enabling um, in there. Um, for those advanced audit policies. Um, so yeah, it just kind of depended on what they were. And the Palantir uh, guidelines are really good, and they break out based on those different uh, types of things, too. Uh, yeah, it was DNS. And if it wasn't DNS, it was BGP. Um, cool. So. 
uh, advantages to sidecar versus WEF. Um, so the sidecar allows you to configure things that WEF doesn't do. So WEF only covers Windows log beats or Windows event logs. Um, if you wanted to monitor, say, IIS logs instead, uh, you need FileBeat to ma to monitor those. Um, it doesn't have any way to ship the IIS logs because it's just a file. Um, so that's the advantage of the sidecar. Um, in our setup, I had sidecar on everything, all of our servers and all of our clients. Um, and then it, I just had the various configuration files in there. And so that way we could actually pull back stuff. Um, one of the things that I never did set up because we hadn't upgraded our Elasticsearch to seven, um, the newer uh, Beats inputs for version seven support modules. And the modules are kind of um, pre-made processors for different things. So uh, IIS uh, log files was one of them. And so you just enable the module and it would automatically break it down and extract it and then send the events over to Graylog all pre-done for you uh, from the endpoint. So um, definitely something to take a look at um, for those modules. And I've seen a, a couple of uh, requests or issues uh, raised on their GitHub page where people are asking for them to add those uh, the modules into it. So. Um, also, there is uh, those audit beats and metric beats and other things, uh, the packet beats and, and things you can add into those uh, that WEF also won't cover for those. Uh, the big advantage of WEF is there's no agent, there's no client. It's all natively built into Windows, nothing to be tampered with. It's actually done through group policy and you can't really turn it off on the client um, without like taking system account and doing stuff. So. Yeah, one of the other advantages of doing a WEF uh, or a Windows event collector is you can uh, layer something up on there. Uh, so log binder, I included it in the um, in the thing, but um, it's a really a supercharger, I should say. That's their product. Um, it has all kinds of rules and stuff you can do, similar to the gray log pipelines. Um, but if like you run into a scenario where your standalone box of gray log is, you're going to have to start scaling out, and you really want to just reduce uh, the resources, you might be able to do something like the log binder to do some of the pre-processing for you on a different server, and then ship a, li a little bit lighter weight stuff. So stripping things out and sending that through, or or something like that. Yeah, the other downside is if you have like thousands of clients, um, you have to step out to a larger uh, gray log because of the number of ports that it's opening um, and or the number of connections, right? The maximum connections that a server can handle. But I don't know that any of us are quite large enough to be running into those issues. Uh, we, we didn't anyway. Cool, let's see if this is back up yet, should be. Yep, so now we see that the Beats, oh, the Beats is running and the Syslog UDP is running, which is great. And I see that data is currently flowing in. Um, so that's great. And if I come here to search, I'm gonna see that I have, uh, this is kind of the meat of it anyway. Um, this is what we've been working towards. I now have logs, which is great, um, but that is not so helpful. Um, I kind of need that data in something that I can use. So you can actually create extractors. And you can do that based on grok patterns. Um, uh, there's these pre-built things for like, hey, let's extract an IP address out or whatever. Um, you can use reg regular expression. Um, so some of these, sometimes you have to build them. Um, there is uh, an open sense, uh, or sorry, I should say the PF sense um, format here. And so let's do this. Let's go to content packs and Greylock marketplace. And um, people have built, um, these content packs. And so you can install these and then it will start parsing things differently. Um, and sometimes these include really cool dashboards and things. Um, and so I know we only have like 15 minutes, so I'm not gonna spend too terribly much time in that. Um, I wanna show the a quick search syntax and then we'll step through all of these different items because there's a handful of things in there that I think be nice to touch on. Um, so let's see here. Uh, here, let's go to inputs. I want to see the beats inputs because um, I can't remember if it's, I'm, I'm now working in multiple sims. Um, so here's a Windows event log that shipped through, right? And it shows some details about 
hey, cool. Um, it should extract a lot of stuff out. It'll tell you about, uh, hey, here's the machine name. Here's the version of the uh, thing. Um, sometimes you'll get IP address. It is pre-pending the WinLog beat on there. I don't know why it's doing that. I thought we turned that off. Yeah, we did. I don't understand. Um, Anyway, so you can start doing cool searches um, based on some of this stuff that says, hey, tell me, um, where the name is that, or the channel is the security log, or um, I want to know uh, even ID 50, uh, 4624. Uh, we can just add that to the query, and now we can find all of those. And of course, my old slow hardware, and I'm, I may have oversubscribed on memory. Um, but anyway, so we do that search, and now we've got all the 4624s, um, which are like the logons. Uh, we've got 4688. Should see some of those. A new process has started. Oh, interesting, right? Um, so you start to get some of those. I don't know that I have Sysmon installed and sending yet. Oh, I do. Hey, cool. Look at that. All right. Um, so Sysmon, uh, I believe that's Sysmon. No, it's not. Event, oh, yeah, event ID. Uh, maybe I'm not sending Sysmon. Anyway, um, so you can start to build out your queries and you can kind of see how it breaks out some of the event data um, and you can do some really cool stuff in your pipelines to kind of customize that. So we would create a new pipeline for say WinLog feeds. Uh, we'll come over to manage rules and in here we can create a rule that if we look at this we can um, see their documentation they have all these rules over here you can say hey if this rule has uh, let's give the rule a name you always have to do that and then say when it has source under ip or des and destination ip then we're going to do something um, or if it matches these things then we're going to do something um, one of the things that i did a lot was rename underscore field um, so if it came in with S, uh, source underscore IP and I use SRC underscore IP for everything, I want to normalize everything so that it uses SRC underscore. So we'll rename that field from one to another. Um, and so all of those are done through these pipelines. Um, and there's just tons and tons of options that you can do in here. Uh, I mean, there's like 12 pages of lookups and all kinds of stuff. Um, it is possible to pull in, um, oh, input failed to start. Oh, that's already working. Um, so it'll show you how much traffic you've been pulling in. And then if we look at the configurations, uh, you can pull in um, stuff from AWS. You can enable the threat exchange stuff. So down here, there's a uh, Tor exit node list, a uh, spam hoss uh, list. So if you're feeding your mail logs uh, into this, uh, it can look up the, um, the IPs of those and see if they're on blacklists and throw uh, or uh, deny lists, uh, throw up the little thing. Um, uh, or alerts for you. And you can even map in a, a GeoLite database um, and you can install that on the Greylog server and then it'll query it, look up the IP and then give you the location and then you can build out really cool maps and stuff. You know, the pew pew with the little lines going everywhere um, on your dashboards. So um, you can, uh, they call it enriching the data um, use tables. So uh, one of the examples, when you log into a machine, it's it gives you a, um, a login ID of like 0x03, which means nothing. But oh, that was an interactive logon versus 0x10, which was a remote uh, logon. So it was done via RDP. Most people aren't going to sit there and just know what all those are off the top of their head. So um, you can use lookup tables um, in there to map all those. And so there's a lot of uh, kind of enriching the data you can do with those pipelines. So nodes, this is where all your nodes would live. If we were actually deploying multiple um, gray log nodes, we'd see them all listed here and we could see them. We can look at the metrics, see how things are working. If you do enjoy playing with APIs, you can click on that and go in there. Um, and here's what we were talking about previously about the buffers. So messages flow into this input buffer, um, then they get saved off to this journal, which apparently is default button now, and it's five gig. I would recommend increasing that if you have a larger environment um, or you plan to have a lot of clients on this. 
um, process buffer after they move out of that, they go into here, they go through all the pipelines and message extraction, the enrichment process, all that stuff. And then it goes into the output buffer, which is where it waits to get shipped into Elasticsearch. So as Elasticsearch is taking in all those events and ingesting it and, and um, putting it all in place, uh, it'll oftentimes has to wait until it's done processing the batch that it received. And so you'll see this output buffer will start to fill up if Elasticsearch is either down or um, is just too busy trying to process messages that are coming into Elasticsearch. So that's what those are. Um, indices. Um, so the indexes, uh, you can create uh, one for, say, Windows or networking. Oops, uh, I need to do that again here for the description and say we want to put uh, networking for all these, right? Um, you can specify what your uh, rotation strategy is. You can say, hey, I want it. I want my indexes to all be 200 gigs, uh, or I want to collect 2,000 messages, or I want it to retain for seven days. Um, the general rule of thumb is to try to shoot for like the 20 to 30 gig on a, on a size. Um, otherwise, if you do one day and you only have like, 400k in them it's kind of it churns the day the uh, file files for no reason and then you can specify whether you want to delete the indexes at the end so you start to rotate stuff out so you can kind of figure out how you might have say four um you go four deep and you have seven days uh as your rotation period now you have 28 days of retention um one of the advantages of setting up these indices uh is that now you can specify um like different lengths of time for different types of logs. So again, you can go to your pipelines and specify where those uh, events go. And so you can reroute those events from say, um, if I know that the host name is my firewall, cool, I'm going to forward those messages into the networking stream. Uh, you can also create these uh, streams and the streams kind of control who is allowed to see messages. Um, so your permissions model is a lot based around these streams and streams are tied to indices. So here's our networking. So we're gonna tie those together and hey, if uh, it matches the networking, I don't want it in the all messages. I want it only available in the networking because hey, maybe I want to make sure they don't see the security sensitive stuff and I only want them to have access to this and other people who have access to all messages maybe don't need to see these. Uh, networking. So uh, here I can click share and then I can add users. Um, they do actually support us. Uh, um, you can do alerts and uh, some rules and stuff in here too, similar to the pipelines. They overlap a little bit, but um, users and teams. <clears throat> You can add individual users and just have them natively log in, but they do actually have um, did I go to the wrong spot? Yeah, I did. Authentication. So we can do Active Directory or LDAP, and we just basically pass in. Uh, I don't even know if this is going to work right now. because I don't have certs or anything. Oh, cool. So anyway, set up your uh, bind account, uh, set up your user synchronization, um, so the DN where you want it to be. And then when you pre-create the user accounts, if they're in the list of accounts that are uh, there, and um, you'll have to manually create a user. Uh, so coming back under here, create your users and assign them to what roles and the roles can map to those uh, um, streams that we created. Um, you'll have to create individual users. Unfortunately, they changed it in version four so that now groups, if you wanna sync groups, say like, like your sysadmins group, um, you have to pay for the enterprise. So manually creating accounts for users seems like not a bad deal for um, free for, for us, so. Um, you can build out custom roles. I never messed with it. Uh, the content packs we talked about, Grok patterns are stripping data out. That, the lookup tables we covered, um, pipelines and sidecars, we covered all of those. So very cool. Um, with the last three minutes, <laughs> uh, we've got these alerts um, that you can create. They're aggregated events or say like, um, uh, you know, hey, I saw the uh, 15 failed attempts in 15 seconds. Cool, that's a brute force attack. I want to have it fire. And you can actually come to these fields and you can specify that you want it to um, use this dollar sign, whatever source format, just pay attention and know that that's there. Um, so that's how you would actually include additional fields in the email that gets sent to you with as a notification. Um, this is still kind of a work in progress as far as their alerts, it's a new system. Um, and so anyway, you have to set up a mail server and some other stuff with it. So 
Um, I think that covers most everything. Sorry we ran out of time. Um, alerts and dashboards was the last one, which allows you to give visualizations and you can like build out really cool stuff in in these dashboards. Um, I had one for like passwords. So it was like failed passwords, uh, locked accounts, um, failed password changes, all that kind of stuff. And then you could just click on it and it would drill in and tell you who the users were and how many times and all that kind of stuff just from a nice simple dashboard. Cool. I did not leave a whole lot of time for um, Q and A, and I didn't even get through everything I wanted. But um, hopefully, that gives a, a good baseline to gray log, uh, centralized logging. Um, and I tell you, it's so much easier uh, to search across all your machines than to log on to four servers, and because uh, you know there's a load balancer in front of them, and then I got to figure out which you know which one the client hit by opening event log. Um, it's just it's painful. So this definitely scales nice. And I'll try to make some more updates to that uh, GitHub repo too, and push those out so you guys can see those. Well, thanks so much for your uh, talk, Nathan. This was fantastic. I have just one yeah. question that came in from the Q&A. It says, event forwarding versus a logging client. Is there a preferred method? Mm. Yeah, so the, um, and I did talk a little on that. It's, uh, so the sidecar I prefer using because it supports more than just Windows event logs, because um, you know you have files. Um, I didn't touch on Linux. We didn't install it. We didn't get there. But um, Audit Beats, um, you can install that and then configure that to, um, the, to sh basically manage Audit D for you, as well as uh, file integrity monitoring. So it'll act as like a tripwire and some other stuff that you can do with that. Um, and that wouldn't get covered. So um, yeah, there's there's some scenarios where I think having the agent on there is helpful, and you can configure all or maintain all of the configuration settings using um, uh, the sidecar um, things. So yeah, I, personally, I would just deploy Sysmon, and then I would use the sidecar with the uh, WinLog Beat agent to pull back the Sysmon, just like we walked through, um, and just start there and just see. Um, don't even worry about the advanced audit policies or any of that quite yet. Um, just focus on Sysmon, good config, deployed, and um, and pull those back. There's actually some malware. Um, the SolarWinds one didn't want to be detected, so it only ran on systems that didn't have Sysmon installed, which was interesting. Um, so there there are some instances where just having it on the box ends up preventing malware from running because they don't they don't want it to get discovered too easily and then you know locked down. So. Um, yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming and uh, enjoy the, the rest of the conference.